<laughs> okay, everybody. We are very pleased to see so many here listening to the hang. Uh, you will have your professor lecture. It's squeezing. Have you found the seat? Uh, concerning 5G positioning. Please go ahead. I will stand there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Anders. <laughs> Let's pull our department's head and the bouncer. <laughs> so I'm very happy so many of you are here for this lecture. It's uh, it's not often that I'm a bit nervous before giving a presentation, but today I should admit I'm a little bit nervous. Um, today I will talk about 5G positioning, which has been one of the research activities that we've been working on in my group over the past three, four years. So before I say what is 5G positioning, let me think back a little bit about what is more traditional positioning. So the most commonly used positioning system is the GPS system, of course. Now, I don't know if many of you know how GPS works. Who is sending signals to whom in GPS? What kind of things are measured in GPS? Who does the computation in GPS? These are all not so obvious questions. So how GPS works is it comprises a number of satellites above the Earth that are all synchronized with atomic clocks. These satellites send towards the Earth, they broadcast signals that are orthogonal. That means the receiver on Earth can receive the signals from many satellites at the same time. What the receiver on Earth does, it measures the arrival time of the signal from multiple satellites. The satellites are also sending their position to the receiver. So then the receiver has an estimate of a time, and this time is the travel time of the signal from the satellite to the receiver plus a clock bias. This clock bias is there because the satellites are all perfectly synchronized with atomic clocks, but my cell phone is not. Okay, so I need to solve both for the position and for the time. So at the end of the day, I have four unknowns, X, Y, Z, and a clock bias. In order to solve for four unknowns, I should have at least four measurements, right? So I should be connected to four satellites. Once I have four satellites, I have four measurements, and then I could solve for the four unknowns. So in a nutshell, that's how GPS works. So this idea of four unknowns and four measurements, um, I want to extend this a little bit, and I have here a slide with what I call rules of thumb. So things that we're going to use in this presentation that could be helpful to get intuitive and understand. So these are rules of thumb, they're not always true, okay, but often they are. My first rule of thumb is that if I have a system with n, un n unknowns, I would like to have n observations enable, enable for me to be able to solve for my unknowns, okay, as a rule of thumb. Obstacles can block electromagnetic waves or they can delay them. If, an if a wave goes through, an obstacle is delayed. Another rule of thumb is that when I have three distances, this determines a unique point. So for instance, here there are three base stations. I measure three distances, that gives me a unique point. So I need three base stations in the plane to localize myself from distances. Similarly, two angles also determine one point because an angle determines a line. Two angles gives me one point. These may be very obvious things, but just to well on the same page. Um, one distance and one angle gives me also one point. Okay, so if there's a base station here and I can measure a distance and an angle, the direction from the base station, something is cut off here, I don't know why, then I can also localize the user. Okay, so distance and angle. All right, now for my uh, communication colleagues, you all know that electromagnetic waves, they propagate really fast at the speed of light. And usually we don't think about this very much, but when we're doing positioning based on time measurements, we need to think about this. Because light in one nanosecond travels 30 centimeters, about this distance. And if 30 centimeters is a target positioning accuracy that I would like, then maybe I need to be able to estimate uh, time with such, with such fine resolution, nanosecond level. Now to tie this back to how communication people may think, Consider a communication system at 20 megahertz, right? And then I'm sending sequences of symbols, QAM symbols. How long does each symbol take? Right, it's one over 20 megahertz. How much, how much distance does light cross in that time? Turns out to be 15 meters. So one symbol is 15 meters in length. Okay, so a data packet is many, maybe kilometers in length. So the, the scales at which synchronization is relevant for communication and for positioning are very different. Okay. Orders of magnitude different. This is what makes positioning, in some cases, much harder than communication. All right, so now we have a little bit of background. 
Now let me formulate what I see as the 5G positioning problem. So we consider a base station, a 5G base station, which has an antenna array. We consider a user equipment, also with an antenna array, 5G user equipment. All of these are operating in high carrier frequencies, the so-called millimeter wave frequencies. There's a signal in the downlink from the base station to the user, and the signal goes over a complex propagation environment, okay, shown here by these lines. And now the 5G positioning problem is the following. From the signal received from a single base station, the downlink in an unknown propagation environment, is it possible for a user, like a car, to estimate its position in 3D, its heading, and its clock bias? And I would say this is a kind of tough problem. Very different from GPS, right? In GPS, you need many satellites to be able to solve your positioning problem. But here, we're going to try to do it with one base station only. At the same time, can we build up a map of the environment? Just like in radar or LIDAR, can we build up a 5G millimeter wave propagation map? And then finally, now I hear this dashed line, which is a line of sight signal. Can I do this even when the line of sight is not there? And I would argue that this red one is a very hard problem. Okay. But we, we work on this area, and actually the answer is yes to all of these. Okay, so this is a little bit of motivation, so now this is the outline for the rest of the talk. I will first talk a little bit about the mathematics of measurement models for positioning, time-based measurements and angle-based measurements. Then talk about the relation between 5G and positioning. And then I move on to some of the activities that we're doing in my research group, together with my collaborators, of course. I'll end with some uh, future prospects and final thoughts. So this here is a picture of a waveform at very high bandwidth sampled by a receiver. Yes, you see multipath, so you see the line of sight path in principle can tell you something about distance. So how does this work? Let's suppose there's a transmitter sending a signal S of T. This propagates over some distance to the receiver and the receiver receives a delayed version of this signal. The receiver estimates the time of arrival of the first path. So then the estimate seen by the receiver is the distance up to the speed of light, plus an unknown clock bias, because transmitter and receiver may not be synchronized, plus noise. Okay. So now if I have a bunch of measurements from a bunch of different transmitters, then maybe I can solve for the position and the clock bias. But this clock bias is a little bit annoying. I want to get rid of this clock bias. So what would I do? So this is here is called time of arrival estimation. So that gives you a time estimate. There's an extension of this called two-way time of arrival estimation. In two-way time, two time of arrival estimation, there's a transmitter sending a signal to the receiver, and the receiver basically echoes it right back. It sends it right back, and then this guy here estimates the time of arrival. Now, the time of arrival measured here will be two times the distance, because the signal goes around, plus a fixed offset, so because this guy says, I'm going to transmit back after one millisecond, for instance, so a known quantity, plus two sources of noise, noise at this side and noise at this side. So now I have a measurement of the distance without any clock bias. This is called two-way time of arrival. And this is used in some positioning systems. There's another way which is more common to get rid of this bias, and that's using time difference of arrival. So this is a picture of time difference of arrival, often used in a cellular communication, where a user is broadcasting a signal to multiple base stations. All these base stations are perfectly synchronized and connected to a central server. So what the first base station sees is the transmitted signal delayed, right, but depending on the distance. So then the first base, base station can take a time of arrival measurement. This time of arrival measurement will be the distance plus the clock bias plus noise. And I can do this for each of the base stations, okay? just like time of arrival estimation. Now what you notice here is that this B is common to all of the measurements because the clock bias is the clock bias of the user with respect to all of the base stations since all of the base stations are perfectly synchronized. So if I now take differential measurements, I say this is the reference base station, for instance, and I take differential measurements with respect to the reference base station, the bias is gone. Then I have differences of distance plus noise. Differences of distance turns out to, the, the, to determine the hyperbola. Just as a distance determines a circle, differences of distances determine hyperbola. So if I have enough measurements, I can figure out that the user must be on the intersection of a number of hyperbola. This is also interesting because it just requires one transmission for the user. The user just broadcasts a signal. If we do time two-way time of arrival, the user would first need to communicate with the first base station, then the second base station, and then the third base station. So that would take a long time. 
This is somehow similar as in GPS. In GPS, the satellites are broadcasting to you, but you don't need to send anything to each of the satellites. Right? That would take a long time. Imagine if each user would have to communicate with individual satellites. It would basically not work. So time difference of arrival has some very good properties. Now, if you have multiple antennas, as we would expect 5G communication systems to have, you can also get angle measurements. And there are two types of angle measurements you can take, angle of arrival and angle of departure. Angle of arrival, many of you will be familiar with. So in angle of arrival measurements, we have the following scenario. There's a transmitter far away sending a signal to an antenna array. This is my antenna array with different antenna elements, and these elements have some spacing, in this case, half a wavelength. Then the signal arrives at the first antenna, and I call this my reference antenna. Okay? The, the, the choice of reference is arbitrary. This is my reference antenna, and the signal I receive is some transmitted signal, let's say up to some scaling. This is some complex number that's unknown, depends on the propagation other effects. This is what I receive on my first antenna. I'm ignoring noise here. What do I receive on my second antenna? Okay, if I look at the wave, the wave front here, the signal is slightly delayed. Okay, the signal arrives a little bit later at the second antenna. How much later depends on the spacing between the antennas and this angle of arrival. So this is the angle of arrival that tells me from which direction am I receiving signals from that user. So the signal on the second antenna is the same as on the first antenna with an additional rotation. Okay, and this rotation depends on the theta, depends on the speed of light, the wavelength, and the carrier frequency. After some math, I find out I can write it like this. Okay, so it's the same as on the reference antenna, but rotated. On the last antenna, I have the signal on the reference antenna with an additional rotation. So now if I have enough antennas, I can solve for alpha and I can solve for theta, right? If I have two antennas, in principle, I have two unknowns and two observations, I can solve the problem. So I can simultaneously estimate the channel plus determine the angle of arrival. And this is a very classical problem already from uh, the 1970s around that time. Now, you can also do angle of departure estimation. Angle of departure estimation is much more, well, much less intuitive. So in this case, the transmitter has multiple antennas and the receiver has a single antenna. Okay. The transmitter sends different signals on each of the antennas and these signals arrive at the receiver in this form. So they go through the channel alpha and each of the signals will be rotated with respect to the reference signal. And this rotation is exactly the same as here. From this observation, if the signals are well designed, the receiver can estimate alpha and theta. And again, this is not very intuitive, so the way that I explain it usually is as follows. Let's suppose Eric there is the receiver. He has only a single antenna. I am the base station. I have lots of antennas. Okay, I have an array of antennas like this. This array allows me to send beams in different directions. So let's say beforehand, I agree with Eric. Eric, I'm going to send 180 beams, one for each degree. Okay, and I start now. I send the first beam, Eric measures the received power. Second beam, Eric measures the received power. So for each beam that I send, he measures the power, and at some point the power will be large. Okay, for beam 55, the power will be large, 56, the power will be large, and the power decays again. So based on those measurements, you can already guess that Eric can figure out the angle of departure. Angle of departure is the departing angle from me to Eric. Okay. But of course, this is a very naive signal design. You can do many more sophisticated signal designs. But these are the kind of measurements that you can take. So what is currently done, or what has been done in cellular communication? If you look at 2G, 2G didn't do any of those time-based measurements. What 2G did was very simple. It just looked at um, the signal strength from different base stations, took the one that has the maximum value, and say, I am at that base station. Okay, so let's say this was the closest base station with the largest signal strength. Then the positioning system would say, I am here, wherever that base station is. So that provides you some position information, but not very accurate, right? Hundreds of meters of uncertainty. But that's what, that what was done in 2G. In 3G and 4G, they realized, ah, we can do these time-based measurements. And this is an example here. Um, this is screenshot from the web, where you see hyperbola corresponding to time difference of arrival measurements. And you see, if you look at the scale of this, still the error is very large. So this provides you uncertainties of tens of meters, okay, from hundreds of meters in 2G to tens of meters in 3G, and even less in 4G. So what will 5G bring? How is 5G different? Okay. So that will be my next topic. So in 5G, there will be a number of unique properties that all come together. 
One of them is that we will move to higher carrier frequencies. So we go away from six gigahertz and below, and we move to 24 gigahertz and above. We will be able to use large bandwidths. We'll have large number of antennas, a transmitter and receiver, especially in those high frequencies. We will have direct communication between two devices, for instance, two vehicles. And we'll have network densification. That means more and more base stations. And I would argue that each of these is good for positioning. So let me walk you through that. First of all, high carrier frequencies. So for those who, who have taken wireless communication course, maybe with me, maybe with Eric, you know that when we teach that course, we have a channel matrix between a transmitter and a receiver, but the transmitter and receiver have multiple antennas. And the way we, we would generate this channel matrix is we say this is a matrix, and I populate this matrix with IID Gaussian entries, complex Gaussian numbers with mean zero and a variance given by pathless and shadow. And that's okay for sub six gigahertz. Now, when you open the millimeter wave paper at these higher carrier frequencies, this is what your channel model would look like. So the channel matrix is determined by a few number of paths, superposition of paths. L could be four or five, not so many. Alpha is the gain of, the of each of the paths, depending on the distance of that path. Then tau L is the delay of a path. So the different paths will have different delays because they take longer to travel. Theta TXL is the angle of departure of the alt path measured in the frame of reference of the transmitter. So if I'm a base station, I have an antenna array. This here is the angle of departure towards Eric or towards another path. Okay. This here is the angle of arrival. This is on Eric's side. If Eric also has an antenna array, Eric can measure angle of arrival. These are these angles. And these A's are the response vectors. They depend on the kind of antennas that we use. Linear arrays or planar arrays, it depends. But the nice thing is that now the channel is really parameterized by geometry. And geometry is good when you want to do positioning. So I would argue in these high carrier frequencies, approximately the channel becomes more sparse and it is more closely related to the physical environment. So for that reason, high carrier frequencies is good for positioning. Secondly, large bandwidths. When you have higher bandwidths, this allows you to do finer delay resolution. And that's one of the principles, for instance, of radar. Radar uses lots of bandwidth to be able to distinguish object at small differences in distance. So if I have two paths arriving with almost the same distance and I have a very small bandwidth, they are blurred together. I cannot distinguish them. But as the bandwidth increases and increases, at some point they will separate. So this picture here shows in an indoor propagation environment, this is from a paper which is cut off from TU Graz, with a two gigahertz bandwidth, how the channel behaves. So here on the y-axis is position. So this is a, a user moving in an environment. On the x-axis is the delay domain, tau. So this is basically, if I cut it through here, some kind of impulse response. So I see the first path, the line of side path after some delay. And as I move, this line of side path arrives at a different time, as I move in different locations. But you also see other paths, so the multi-path components. And these multi-path components, the strong ones, they relate to something in the environment. So there was probably a wall somewhere that gave rise to one of these multi-path components. So by measuring the arrival time, you can say something about where walls are. So large bandwidth is good. It gives you high delay resolution. So what about antennas? For similar reason as bandwidth, antennas give you high resolvability and angle. If I have a large array at my receiver, I can resolve angle of arrival really, really well. That means when there's a, let's say, a transmitter in the back of the room and two symmetric paths arriving to me with exactly the same delay, if I have an antenna array, from, I can distinguish the different paths according to their angle. Similarly, if I have a large number of transmit antennas, I can uh, have good resolution angle of departure. This can be done by sending very narrow beams. So at the end of the day, having a large antenna array, a transmitter and receiver is good for angular resolution. And of course, angles is good for position. Device to device communication. So when you have devices that can communicate directly with each other, that also provides an opportunity to measure things with respect to each other. So you can imagine two cars that measure distances and angles with respect to each other. So you have relative position, just as you have in radar. When you have measurements between cars, you can go, or between user devices, you can go to this literature of so-called cooperative positioning. And actually, when I first interviewed at Chalmers, I gave a talk on cooperative positioning. So this is a long time ago. 
But you can show just by having more information in the network, you can do better in terms of accuracy. So you can position users better, even when they're out of coverage with respect to the base station. Finally, network densification. If we, for instance, would have millimeter wave access in this room, probably there would need to be a base station somewhere here in this room. Once we have a base station in this room, then everybody's in line of sight with respect to the base station. And the line of sight path is the one that's most useful for positioning. Okay. So that's why it's very good to have line of sight. So network densification, which will be a property of 5G, will be good for us. So now you have some, at least some intuition why 5G would be interesting for positioning to work. So now I go back to this problem and try to describe some of the activities that we've been doing in our group the last few years. And we've done many things, so I apologize if I cannot talk about what everybody in my group has been doing, but at least some of them will see their work here. Um, so our approach has been roughly as follows. We first determine good channel models. Okay, and this is both that we take channel models from the literature or we work with our collaborators to develop new channel models. We also have to define a geometric model of our environment because the environment now becomes important because I have angles and delays with respect to multipath components. We work with different sets of knowns and unknowns. This means we work with different kind of observation models. Uh, can we measure angles or delays or both? Different sets of unknowns. Is the user synchronized to the base station or not? Then we spend a lot of time on developing performance paths. So we try to figure out from a theoretical point of view, what is the best that you can achieve? Because once you know what is the best you can achieve, then you can start developing algorithms and try to approach these bounds. Once you get close to the bounds, you can stop working on the algorithm, you can start working on complexity. Um, once we have the algorithms, once we have the bounds, we derive the algorithms, make sure that they are robust, and then we demonstrate with real data. Now, we've been doing progress on all of these except the last part, but I hope in the next two years through an FFI project, we will, we will be able to do this. So first, a geometric model. How does this look like? So this is a 3D picture here where there's the base station. There's the user device here with an unknown position and an unknown orientation. It could also have an unknown clock bias with respect to the base station. There's a line of sight path from the base station to the user in green. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not there. Then there are obstacles in the environment. So there could be large obstacles like here, this is a wall. And there could be small obstacles like here, like a lamppost. And there can be paths from the base station to small obstacles to the user and paths from the base station via large obstacles to the user. Now, how we parameterize this environment is through scattering points. So we say the lamp we abstract as a point. It's like a point in space. And this means when the user is moving, this point in space is fixed, while the lamp is itself not moving. This incidence point on the way of the wave on the surface, as the car is moving, will move. Right. Remember, when you walk by a building and you see the sun, as you move, the sun will move. So we don't want to capture this as a description of the wall. Instead, we define a so-called virtual anchor. A virtual anchor is the reflection of the base station with respect to the surface. And that's how we parameterize a wall. It's kind of an infinitely long wall. So what we want to estimate is the user state, these scatter points, and these virtual anchors. And of course, this problem is complicated because when we see a path, we don't know if it's from a small object, a large object, is it the line of sight path? So the problem is not so straightforward. Now to tie this back to the millimeter wave channel, I'm going to go into 2D, so make this flattened. And then the picture becomes like this. I have a transmitter here. This could be my base station. The base station has a known position and a known orientation. So the base station essentially determines the frame of reference. I have here the receiver. The receiver has an unknown position and also an unknown orientation. So it's important to note that when you have Things with antenna arrays, orientation becomes important. If I have my phone here, this is one state of the phone, this is another state of the phone. So even though the position hasn't changed, the orientation has changed. So orientation becomes important because the angles of arrival, shown here, are measured in the frame of reference of the receiver. So now I have paths between the transmitter and the receiver, a line of sight path, and a path via some small object, for instance. For each path, I have a distance corresponding to a delay. For each path, I have an angle of departure measured in the frame of reference of the transmitter and an angle of arrival measured in the frame of reference of the receiver. Now, this is my channel model from before, my millimeter wave channel model. 
right? So I have paths, channel gains, angles of arrival, angle of departure, and delay. And these A's depends on the structure of the array. Now, a millimeter wave, typically, you can have a very large number of antenna elements, hundreds, many hundreds, possibly. For reducing the complexity of the transmitter and receiver, you would typically use something called pre-coding and combining. Typically, the transmitter and the receiver may have a limited number of RF chains, or maybe 10 RF chains on the base station, one RF chain or two RF chains on the receiver. And in order to deal with that, you do pre-coding and combining. This means going from a large dimensional space to a big dimensional space and the other way around. So at the end of the day, mathematically, you get something like this. X of T here is the transmitted signal from the base station. This is a pilot signal. This is known to both the transmitter and the receiver. F is a pre-coding matrix. So this is um, a very tall matrix that goes from a small dimensional space, so X is maybe two dimensional, to a large dimensional space, because maybe you have 100 antenna elements. HL is the channel matrix corresponding to the alt path given by this. And at the receiver, I will apply a combining matrix. So this combining matrix goes from the large antenna space, maybe I have hundreds of antennas, to one or two data stream space. And now the positioning problem in the first instance becomes like a statistical estimation problem, right? Given this signal here and given some W and F, I want to estimate theta and tau and the other theta here. Once I've done that, then I need to do some conversion to find the position. So this is the signal model. Now let me spend one slide on bounds. I won't show any math regarding the bounds, just some of the results. So there's lots of curves here, but I, I guess I mainly want to talk about some intuition here. So let me, let me hide this. Let's suppose that I have a line of sight path. Right? In the line of sight path, how many unknowns are there? Let's say Eric is the receiver and the transmitter. The number of unknowns is just Eric's state. So it's three-dimensional position, and let's say two-dimensional orientation, five unknowns. How many measurements does Eric get? How many observations can he collect from the line of sight path? He can get the delay, time of arrival of the line of sight path. He can get the angle of arrival and angle of departure. And if we use planar arrays, we can get these angles in azimuth and elevation. So you get five knowns and five unknowns. Okay, so that's good. Now let's suppose we, we, we put a wall here. Boom, there's a wall. How many unknowns does the wall bring? Any guess? Two or three. Okay. Let's say three unknowns is the incidence point of the wave on the wall. But that's something that we don't know because we don't know where the wall is. How many observations do we get? Five again. Right, we get delay of that path, plus we get angle of arrival, angle of departure, and azimuth and elevation. So this means that in the millimeter wave regime with antenna arrays, you're getting way more observations than unknowns, even when you add more and more paths. And this then brings me to this result. So this here, this is from a, a fundamental performance bound analysis. We show how many paths are needed to do the positioning. So on the x-axis, I show the number of non-line of sight paths. Okay, so everything except the line of sight path. On the y-axis, I show a lower bound on the accuracy. This is how well you can do positioning. So lower is better. And then there's many cases. So let's look at an extreme one here. And if we look at the legend, this is an LOS. So this means there's no line of sight path. There's an unknown clock bias between transmitter and receiver. So they're not synchronized. And I have no map information. So I don't know anything about the environment. And the analysis tells you that if you have three non-line of sight paths, the problem becomes identifiable. So in principle, it should be possible to localize and synchronize a receiver. When you add more paths, things get better. If the bias was known, then we go to the red one, then we are here. Is that true? Yeah, with known bias, so then the problem is easier, and then the position error bound is much lower. So this is something I think is really cool. So from the signals from a single base station, only in one direction, you can estimate the position, the orientation, the clock bias, and map the environment. And you can even do it when the line of sight is not there. So these are just performance bounds. So you can ask yourself, what about algorithms? So the first algorithms we tried was from this paper. Um, what we did was just nonlinear least squares. Okay? We just did least squares, gradient descent, the most simple algorithm that you can try, and these are the results. 
So the scenario is the same as before, a transmitter, a receiver, a line of side path, and a few uh, scatter points. And we do not know where these scatter points are. The, let's look at the figure in the bottom. The x-axis is SNR, the y-axis is the root mean square error, so the, how well I can position the user. The dashed line is the fundamental performance bound, the best we can achieve. And in blue is the simple least squares, nonlinear least squares. And you see even here, for sufficiently high SNR, you get very close to the bound, which is what you would expect. And this, we didn't know anything about the environment, so I think this is a very nice result. So then we said, okay, to the student, let's block the line of sight. Let's put a big obstacle here. So the big obstacle is here, the line of sight is gone. What you see is that, well, the bound still exists. The problem is identifiable. And by some small tweaks to the algorithm, we can get close to the bound. What we lost is somehow absolute performance. If you look for that minus 30 dB, um, I get the bound is 10 to the 1, so 10 meter. If I go back here at minus 30 dB, it's much less. Okay. This is because the line of side path is very valuable for positioning. But even if it's not there, you can still get a position fix. It may not be very good, but you can still do something. So in this case, these results consider just these scatter points and the line of side path. But what if we want to do mapping? What if we want to say something more about the propagation environment? Here we just say the, the waves hit something and then reflect it back to the receiver. But we want to now say, what did they hit? Did they hit a large object or a small object? And then we go into data association and mapping. So let's consider the following scenario. There's a car here driving. There's a base station here. And there's a line of sight path, this one. And there's a no line of sight path. And it's hitting this wall. So there's an incidence point here. Now let's suppose that the car can say with some confidence that one of the paths was indeed a line of sight path. The other path, it doesn't know where it came from, right? So we have here the virtual anchor, the reflection of the base station with respect to the wall. But from this one path, the car doesn't really know what was the origin of that path. Was there some small object there and no wall? Or was there a wall and no small object? We don't know. But then we drive, okay, then we get here. And then we have, again, the line of sight path and the non-line of sight path. And the, the non-line of sight path here is now only consistent with the virtual anchor. It is not consistent with the lamp hypothesis anymore. Right, because otherwise the lamp would have moved, the incidence point has moved. So you can remove this hypothesis and just say, okay, there's a wall there with some confidence. So this is a way that you can do mapping. So now I want to show a small video, and I guess many things can go wrong now. Okay, and they do. Let's see. Okay, so this here is a picture of a base station. There's a car, okay, which is a small cross, driving in a circle around this base station. There's an environment with many obstacles. So there's all these um, small triangles. These are small objects in the environment. There are also four walls in the environment. I don't show the walls, but I show the virtual anchors corresponding to the walls. So there's a virtual anchor here corresponding to a wall aligned like this. Okay, so there's a wall here. And if I reflect the base station with respect to that wall, I get this virtual anchor. Now the car is moving in this environment and it, it sees paths, right? And a path is a delay, an angle of arrival, angle of departure. And with each path, it needs to decide where does it come from. When it sees something new, like a path coming from this direction, it says, okay, I don't know what this is. Maybe it was a scatter point or maybe it was actually from a wall. And if it's from a wall, then probably the wall should be, I don't know where, maybe here. So it generates these two hypotheses. And as it's moving, one of the hypotheses will be incorrect. So let's see. OK. No. No. Sorry. One of the hypotheses will be incorrect. And then it can fix says, OK, it was actually a scatter point or it was a virtual anchor. So as it goes around this environment, it can put things in the map with high confidence. And it can then have a map that it can use later for positioning. So the positioning will get better, too. And you can then think to extend this to multiple vehicles or do many more fancy things. But this is in principle what we do. So we use underlying mathematical techniques, which I don't describe, to be able to distinguish between different types of sources and build up a map of the environment at the same time localize the vehicle. I have another movie which I wanted to show, which does not relate to 5G positioning, but it's nice to show, show some movies. It's a 
later part of the talk. So this was work done by Marcus, who's unfortunately not here, and also Carl, who's sitting there on the back, on um, tracking and positioning. So here are the scenarios as follows. We consider two cars that are approaching an intersection. One car has good GPS, the other car has bad GPS, and they can communicate with each other. Question is, can the car with good GPS help the car with bad GPS? And the way that we solve it here is by letting both cars observe the same environment. So they both have camera, they both see the same things, and they discuss what they see. And by this discussion, the car with good GPS can help the car with bad GPS. This is what this video will show. I hope this works. Of course, the mark is the <laughs> So two cars are driven the same scene, basically two pedestrians. So our vehicle is the good GPS and the auto is the bad GPS. So if they don't collaborate, you see that the error the error stays locked, right? So the error does not decrease or increase significantly. Now we let them communicate. So the car with good GPS will share information with the car with bad GPS, and that will help the car with bad GPS move right back. So here they, they go in the family. Now they start communicating. They see the same environment. They talk about this environment and small packets back and forth. And then you will see that the localization of the car with bad GPS gets significantly better. And then when they don't see the same things anymore, the car with bad GPS goes position quality. It's the same thing. So once they start seeing the same environment, the car with bad GPS is well localized. Once they no longer share the same environment, they can no longer see the same things. The color bad GPS is kind of fully localized. And this was done in the context of uh, the Coplar project as well as the EU High School. So now we've seen some moving. So where is this going? What do we plan to do in the future? So I've been working a lot on this 5G position, right? And now in the recent years, mainly because Jonan joined us, we started working on radar as well. So let's try to connect radar and position, radar 5G. So in 5G, we will have communication, we'll have carriers above 28 gigahertz or around that. Okay? So high carrier frequencies. We will have large bandwidths available, hundreds of megahertz potentially. We'll have large antenna arrays, a transmitter and receiver, possibly hundreds of antennas. We will sample a large fraction of this bandwidth. Okay? We'll have high rate ADCs. We'll have coordinated transmissions. Okay? There's a base station that will tell you can transmit then over this frequency. It's mainly a communication technology, but I hope I have convinced you through this talk today that it can also be used for positioning and for mapping. Okay, so you can help to localize a user and you can also map the propagation environment. So it's a little bit like a bi-static radar. Now, if you look how radar works, radar also has very large carrier frequencies, much higher than 28 gigahertz. It uses very large bandwidths possibly multiple gigahertz. It now has typically a few antenna elements, but this is rapidly growing. So not modern radars can have tens of antennas. A major, major difference is that you sample with a very low rate ADC. So radars are very cheap devices and they sample only with maybe 10 to 40 megahertz. The way they can span this four gigahertz is they sweep. Okay, so they sample parts of this band over time and they change which, which part that they sample. They have uncoordinated transmissions. Okay? Your radar does not talk to any other radar and say, okay, I'm gonna transmit, now you shut up. It's mainly a mapping technology, but maybe it can also be used for communication. So this uncoordinated transmission turns out to be a big challenge. So we've been working with Volvo and Vionier for the last year, because Volvo came to us and they said, okay, as more and more cars have more and more radars, and as there are more autonomous vehicles, hopefully coming in the future with lots of radars, these radars will interfere with each other. And this is extremely detrimental. You can imagine a standard radar will send a signal, it bounces off the environment, and you get the backscattered signal with very low power. If there's now another radar there transmitting at exactly the right time in you, he will basically blind you. And this, people have observed this, for instance, in parking lots with lots of cars driving slowly, that your car behaves in a kind of strange way. This is because of interference. So we've been working on the problem of how to reduce this interference by using communication. Because we let the radars talk to each other and synchronize their transmissions. So we believe that radar can be a communication technology. So what do I think will happen? 
So I've shown that radio signals can provide position information. In fact, they have always done this, even at the GPS, uh, with the GPS, long time ago. The particular properties, such as high frequencies, large bandwidths, and many antennas, are very good for positioning. Okay. They provide lots of information that we didn't have before. In 5G new radio, so in 5G millimeter wave, we should be able to do single anchor positioning, so with a single base station, estimate heading or orientation in general, do synchronization and map the environment all at the same time. So this becomes like a new type of radar. And now 5G millimeter of positioning is a study item in 3GPP. So for a release 17, this will probably be built in. On the other hand, radar, FMCW radar, is a single anchor relative sensing technology, and we believe it can be a new type of communication link. So maybe in a few years from now, when you ask yourself the question, is this a radar or 5G link? It may be both. So I can see a future where radar is no longer FMCW, but is in fact 5G. You'll have a 5G modem on the front of your car, and that will serve as radar, and everything is coordinated by the base station. And you can imagine when I tell this to Ericsson, they get very excited. <laughs> so this is the end of the technical part of my presentation. I want to just thank a few people here. It's been 10 years since that I've been here now, so I want to thank the PhD students for whom I served as main supervisor, and it's nice that both Gabriel, who was my first student, and Jin Shan, who's my most recent recruited student, are both here in the room. Uh, also the students I co-supervised over the years, postdocs that I worked with, postdocs that I shared with Balash. So when I look back, it's a large team of people. I cannot thank everybody that I worked collaborate here in the last few years. I want to especially thank uh, three more people. First of all, Eric Agral, who invited me for an interview here. Uh, Eric Strom, who created this wonderful environment the last few years, a really intellectually stimulating and very friendly and warm place. Um, I actually found a picture from 10 years ago, almost to the date. This is a picture in May 2009 when I signed my contract, my first contract here at Shaw. <laughs> I don't know if you can recognize me. But... <laughs> so it's been a really interesting 10 years. I really enjoyed it, and I look forward to the next few years under uh, Frederick's leadership. Thank you. Was on the user side. Okay, and uh, so what, and what kind of accuracy you get? Uh, well, it, it really depends on many things. It depends on the band, it depends on the signal to noise ratio, the beam forming, number of antennas. So I cannot just give you a number, but we are hoping for sub meter accuracy. Okay. Uh, so something that maybe is, could be supported autonomous drive, for instance. Uh, that, that's our target. So. And when you deploy all the list of things that mm -hmm. uh, is coming with 5G, uh, well, of course, uh, I think you still don't have uh, algorithms on the user side. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of uh, complexity we need to expect? Because, you know, if you run a complex algorithm on the user side, well, for yeah, so I, I don't think at the end of the day the algorithms will, will not run on the user side. I think they will okay. be running on the cloud. Because at least our algorithms right now, the positioning algorithms are very simple. But when you go to the mapping algorithms, they're horribly complex. So I can imagine that the user, you will send your measurements to the cloud and the cloud will solve. Just as it's done right now in 4G positioning, you don't actually compute anything yourself. It's the cloud that does it for you. Because you didn't even know where the base stations are. I have a question. So when you do this 5G localization, what kind of reference signals are you assuming to transmit? Is it like the pilots of reusable channels <coughs> or do you need special signals? So up till 3G, they were just standard pilots. In 4G, they realized that actually we should have special pilots for positioning. And then they, de they developed these positioning reference symbols. So there are pilot signals that are spaced in spe specific ways in the time frequency grid. Now with 5G, I think this will be extended to also the spatial domain. Like you need specific kind of beams to help position. So that I think will be the story. So it's not the standard pilots. These are really dedicated pilots for positioning. How often this uh, estimation of the position is supposed to run? Uh, not, very, not very frequently. I, I would say on your 100 milliseconds. So this is, I mean, at the communication level, this is very 
rarely, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you don't move very fast. Right? It depends on the application, of course, for vehicles versus human mobility. What about vehicles? Uh, how far would they move from that? Um, oh, I cannot see. You, you can divide uh, <laughs> 25 meters per second. And per second. <laughs> right, it's not very hard. No, no, but it's a few centimeters, I guess. Okay. Oh, two and a half meters. At that case, okay. 25 meters per second, 90 kilometers. Yeah, yeah, okay. Per hour. Two and a half meters. Meter. Okay, sure. Two and a half meters. Yeah. yeah. But then, okay, you can increase the update frequency, of course. And also, 5G will not be the only sensor that's used for position. There will be many other sensors in the vehicle. <coughs> it's just a complementary sensor. Okay. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask something in relation to that. So, what do you think? Uh, what's the robustness of 5G positioning? And how will we use it? Will it be the only sensor? No, yeah, I know already answered. Yeah, nobody will think it's the only sensor. Even now, in true GPP um, standardization, they don't see 5G as its own positioning system. It will be integrated with GNSS. It will be integrated with barometers. So, for sure, there will be a huge sensor fusion engine on top of that. So, what are the like weaknesses in what environments? Where would could we not rely on 5G? <laughs> okay, so we foresee what I presented here today to be mainly for like. Urban centers, like the picture I showed in the beginning in Singapore, where GPS doesn't work, where you will have this 5G millimeter wave access, and then I think it's a good place to use it. So these kind of harsh environments, also indoors. Eric? Yeah, so maybe I can add also something to the, the positioning problem, as you posted now, was basically geometric uh, position and orientation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Time, I think, is also of interest here, right? So, I mean, the, you would like to know the position of an object within a certain time, right? Mm -hmm. Because then it's possibly moved yes. also. So this is, an, uh, I think, an interesting mm -hmm. case to add to this also, especially when it's autonomous drive. If you put it up to the sure. cloud and it thinks for, for two minutes and it goes back sure. to use it. Right? Yes. Uh, and the yeah. second thing I was wanted to pick your brain about, uh, there are some people looking into uh, or very excited about positioning for basically using uh, whatever RF uh, mm. powers which is out there already, mm. not yeah. tailored to positioning, but yeah. just sure. passively listening to systems. What, what your opinion about that? It's like opportunistic exactly. positioning. Right. It's a very hard problem because right. it, it depends how much knowledge you have of the signal structure to be able to, be able to estimate anything. I mean, the classical problem is direction of arrival positioning, where you just need some statistics of the signal source and then you can estimate something. But in general, I think these are very hard problems. I was talking at ICASP on Sunday with many people about this. And it, it's just really hard. And I, I try to stay away from problems that I think are too hard to make a contribution. Yeah. It's like underwater positioning. I don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not with R, please. Not, no, not, not even at acoustics. It's too many degrees of freedom and uh, unpredictable propagation. So, Pontus. So, result about stationary scatters, what about uh, like other cars moving scatters? Are they like just the problem or just too hard? Or? It depends. No, it depends how you see them, right? Because even if it's a car that's there just for a second, it still provides a path. So, I can still use it as a source of information, but I should probably not put it in my permanent map. Right. It's still a physical source. So I think the measurements that maybe traditionally you would see as clutter, to me, they're still measurements. But as long as there's something physical tied to it and it gives me a source and things are geometrically consistent, it's just another source. It just over the next time I measure, the source will be gone. So I wouldn't put it in my map. You need to think about it. Gabriel. Have you looked at the example you showed here in 20 for one car. Mm. Have you looked into how do we aggregate outside it, not only speak how do we aggregate the information that should be able to work? Yeah, we're working on that now. That's uh, current research that I'm doing with Carl and exactly this. So. so maybe next year I can talk about it. <laughs> you know. When you have an array and you want to look in all directions at the same time, basically, you, there's a lot of computations. So basically, you have to delay each signal to 
it's not gives this correlation. You can do it digitally. You just sample once and then you do it digitally. Yes, but uh, is computation an issue if, if you want to look in many directions at the same time? Uh, it depends who does it, right? That the computation at the user side is always an issue. Computation at the base station side, not so much. It might be an issue in a, in, in a server telephone. Yes, but maybe not in a car. A car, especially autonomous car, will have lots of computation power. Can you, in the future, what will happen actually? And all that stuff. Uh, when can we expect that local information from each vehicle will be mapped into the framework of the complete communication concept? It's a bit complicated question, but uh, I mean, right now, both in Europe. You can give me an idea. Easy, yeah, yeah, sure. But okay. <laughs> in, now in Europe, US, and, and China, they're looking at ways for cars to communicate. Right? For instance, Volkswagen has said all cars from now on will have uh, Wi Fi based communication between cars. And there's right now a big battle going on between different standards a Wi Fi based standard versus a, versus a 5G standard. But uh, I think communication of some form between a significant fraction of the vehicles. Will happen in the next three to four years, but to have a kind of complete ecosystem where 5G is a part of this, this will be on the longer time. But it also depends on which technology will win the the economic battle, right? The, the Wi-Fi based communication <coughs> or 5G. I put my money on 5G. But... Well, I'm sorry, you lost it. <laughs> <laughs> there will be uh, for sure both. Yeah, yeah. Well, the short term, yes. But okay, okay. Okay, yeah. I have some obje objections to Wi-Fi communi Wi-Fi based communication. It doesn't matter because it's a mandate. Yes, and yeah. the EU now it's mandated, and the US not, and China would probably go for cellular based communication. Right? So, my prediction is we will follow China. <laughs> we'll see. We can talk in a few years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yesterday we were talking about security. And this uh, presentation touched uh, the security issues. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything which you will share with us about how we should uh, position us when it comes to security? Issues? You mean we as researchers? Mm -hmm. I think we should be aware that there are these, these security issues, right? There's privacy issues with any position in technology. There's dual use issues, misuse issues. So I think we should be aware that they exist and take them into account. I don't, I don't think we should necessarily from the ground up build them in. Because then I think there's a risk we don't make scientific progress. We just get stuck. But yeah, I, I think people working in positioning, this is always a consideration. And it's always a question we get when we give presentations. So we know. But uh, I don't work in, in the area of security itself. It's, no. But I hope uh, some of us will do that. But in uh, Chalmers, there are many people that do it. But also, I mean, it has to do a little bit with if, if one designs the system, it can, you can design it to be more or less amenable to privacy, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if the position is uh, uh, computed by the device, that, that, that seems to be more privacy uh, preserving yes, than if yes. it's computed by the network. So, there are things one can think about from a scientific from a Set up point of view to enable locate or you know pass them through. Mm -hmm. But there's also the issue that the, the signals themselves can enhance security and privacy. For instance, there's like if you have a, a car key yes. that does some distance estimation, that's not something you can falsify. That's something. Well, that's mar harder to falsify, yeah. right? So that can provide some added security. Sure. If you have not today's, wide band. today's keys are not very safe. No, 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 but I think by, by putting this kind of geometric and position-based relation there, you can make them much more safe. So in some sense, it can help because it depends on physics, right, the environment. Tell me. There are some visions to work on because in security frameworks, there are many things, right? So one is also reliability, where uh, ethical or uh, to what active, uh, active, uh, yeah, I mean, what is 
I don't know. I don't want any ambitions in that no. direction. I, I'm very focused on very specific things. So there's many interesting topics, but I mean, someone is kind of interference uh, situation could actually work something. Yeah, no, no, for, for sure. This is an issue, right? But I think for any radio technology, you can have a jammer and you can have mitigation techniques for it against jamming. But no. Okay, sorry. <laughs> but maybe you can. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,